All right, choir, come on up. We got a minute till. Come on, choir. Today, Merry Christmas to you. Glad you're here. Thank the Lord you've taken time to be in the Lord's house. Brother Jody, y'all pray for him. <laughs> Mr. Christmas has come to church today. I'm going to tell you something. It takes a man to wear that. Am I right? That's right. It takes a man to wear that. How are you? All right, we're going to read from the Word of God this morning. As the choir gets settled up here, we're going to read. And then the choir's going to sing, and then we'll receive the offering. We'll preach a few minutes and let you be on your merry way. Just don't get too much eggnog in you this year, all right? <coughs> Speaking of that, y'all like that stuff? No. No? Randy's back there doing no one here. No. Uh, hadn't had it in years. But you know what I really don't like? There's two things about Christmas I despise. Can I tell you what they are? Yeah, on. You can guess one of them, can't you? Glitter. Glitter. <laughs> <laughs> Numero dos, fruitcake. Mm. That is some ungodly stuff. All right, Psalm 102 this morning. Psalm 102. <coughs> There's Oliver. Welcome back, buddy. Good to see you. Psalm 102. The title in my Bible calls this The Lonely Soul. You ever feel that way? The Lonely Soul. David says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I'm in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke. And my bones are burned as an heart. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of thine indignations and thy wrath. For thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever. In thy remembrance of all generations, thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the time, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory and shall regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For thou hast looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. To hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord, he weakened my strength and the way he shortened my days. He said, oh, I said, O oh my God, take not me away in the midst of thy days, my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. 
Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hand. They shall perish, but thou, thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. Amen. That is the word of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege you've given us to be back in your house. Thank you for this season and what it stands for. Thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world that he might bear our sins in his own body on the cross that we might be saved by the grace of God. That is the greatest gift, and I thank you for it. And Father, this morning I pray for those in our church family who are sick. There are several here today who are in the process of recovery, and I pray that you'd continue to help them improve and help them to get well. And we have several who are still homesick today. We pray for them and ask that you bless them and raise them up. And Father, we have others who are in the hospital and the nursing home, who are homebound today, who would love to be in the house of God, but they can't be because of sickness. And Father, I pray that you'd be with them and comfort them in this season, minister peace to their hearts. But most of all today, I pray for those among us, those who are listening to us, who are not saved. I pray that you'd speak to their hearts, and I pray that you'd draw them to Jesus. As the choir sings, as the gospel is preached this morning, may you be glorified and may you draw sinners unto yourself, and may you strengthen the hearts of your children that we might rejoice in you. Thank you for a God who is worthy of our praise, and thank you for your blessings on our church this year. Continue, Father, in the year to come. May we see your hand grow stronger around here for your great glory. I bless your name and I love you. Thank you for your goodness. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. For the CJ, going to come lead the choir this morning. Pray for him as he does.
Merry Christmas Eve. Can you believe it's that time of year? This is my favorite time of year. I love this Christmas music, and I love the message it brings. It, it says, um, all right, um, for offering, you're going to turn to page 94 in your hymnals, and we're going to sing Joy to the World, uh, verses 1, 2, and 4, as we stand. <coughs> You may be seated. Want to go there? <coughs> that's pretty. What do you reckon? That's Italy or Spain or somewhere along in there? You've been in the Mediterranean, haven't you? Yeah, you. You haven't been over there? I thought you went over there. You should go. <laughs> Tell Nick I said to take it. All right. <coughs> Brother Jim Atkins, you been there? Yeah, yeah, he's been there. Does that look like what that is? I didn't see that place. Okay, well, never mind. That could be somewhere here in Illinois. We just haven't found it. I don't know. Y'all pray for me. My mind is broken. All right. You turn in your Bible to what it says up there, Genesis chapter 3. Somebody hit them choir lights for me over there. Hey, Bobby, you, Brother Bobby, you get them choir lights, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Genesis chapter 3. If you know what happens in this chapter, then you know what happens in this chapter. And it is not good. Well, we're going to talk about it for a few minutes. I really want to zero in on one verse today, but before I do, before it slips my mind and it will, on the 27th of this month, that's on a Wednesday, I believe, right? Yeah, is that right? Pat and Reg going to celebrate 64 years of marriage. Isn't that something? 64 years. Oh, they deserve that. And a few thousand dollars apiece, y'all ought to give that to them. Amen. Be a blessing. <laughs> Congratulations. That's amazing. It's a blessing. That is a blessing. My wife and I are still a long ways from that. I'm glad God let y'all have that. Good. Keep praying for them. They're a blessing to us. 
All right, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read a lengthy section here, and I promise to preach from one verse. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle, more sneaky, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then shall your eyes be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, God, said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou shalt return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken. For dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothes them. We'll be, we'll be stopping there. This may seem like a very strange passage preach about on a Christmas Eve. Yet, amid man's greatest tragedy comes the revelation of man's greatest hope. Right in the middle of this scene of such depravity and wickedness and even judgment, there is a lot of glory shining. Because it is in this tale of sin and judgment and death that we meet the message of the saving gospel and the person of the Lamb of God for the very first time. This is it, right here. God made man in his image, right? We'll see that in a minute. And God made man in perfect innocence. And God placed that man in an ideal environment. Adam has been given dominion over the Lord's creation 
and he is presented with an ideal companion, a woman by the name of Eve. They live idyllic lives, lives that are free from pain, death, disease, and sorrow. Every need is met, and they enjoy unbroken, unhindered fellowship with Almighty God. The only restriction they have concerns one little tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam, back in chapter 2, is warned that he must not eat of that tree because if he does, he will die. And so for an undefined period of time, things go very well in the garden until one day Eve finds herself near the tree God has forbidden. While she is there, she encounters a serpent. And the serpent tells her that God is holding out on her and Adam. And the serpent implies that God does not want to eat them from that tree because God knows that when they do, they will become like him and they will have all knowledge as well. He lied to her. Now Eve succumbs to the temptation of the devil and she eats the fruit. Adam also consumes the fruit. He falls for the lie. In an instant, everything changes for them. They are no longer innocent and pure. But now they have become sinners and fallen beings, and immediately they recognize that everything has changed. I don't know how they perceived themselves before they ate the fruit, but now they recognize they're naked. Their nakedness is, is exposed. It always has been, but for the first time, they are ashamed. And they seek to cover themselves, the Bible says, with fig leaves. And then they attempt to hide themselves from God. God comes walking in the garden to have fellowship with them as he does probably every day, and they hide themselves, but God knows what they've done. And God approaches Adam first because he is the head. God placed him over creation, and God confronts him first, and God extracts a confession from Adam. That's in verses 10, 11, and 12. And as soon as he does, the blame game begins. Adam blames God, and he blames the woman. He said, I was fine till she got here, and the only reason she's here is because of you. So the blame game began. God confronts Eve. Eve immediately blames the serpent. But God pronounces judgment upon Adam, Eve, and the serpent, and he casts them out of the garden of Eden. Now we know about that, right? That is the fall of man. That's why our world is in the shape it is in today. That's why there's such hatred and warfare and meanness in our world. It is because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. We know blackness, the black pall of sin has fallen across our world. And we're in a mess today because of what they did. Yet right in the middle of this tragedy, there is a flicker of hope. One verse shines out like a great beacon illuminating God's amazing plan. Verse 15 is the verse I'm referring to where God tells them something big is going to be happening down the road, something they can't understand right now. God says a Redeemer is coming. God says one is coming who will change everything back to the way it should have been all along. Because verse 15 tells us the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. The serpent will bruise his heel, yes, but in so doing he will experience a crushing blow and all of his work and all of his effort will be brought to nothing. What we see here for the first time is a glimpse of the Lamb of God who will later give himself on the cross at Calvary to redeem a lost and dying world. 
we see the first glimmer of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this precious verse gives us here in seed form the first promise of the coming of the Lamb of God. And I want to talk about this passage today and tell you what the birth of Jesus means for you. Because there are some truths here that we do not want to miss this morning. So, what does the birth of Jesus, and that's what we're celebrating this time of year, right? I mean, a lot of us, probably some of the younger set, are looking forward to tomorrow to see what they get for Christmas. But some of the older set are looking for the same thing. But every one of us should have at the center of our Christmas preparation, our Christmas thought, our Christmas celebration. We should have Jesus at the center of our festivities because He is the reason we do this. So what does the birth of Christ mean for you? Well, what it means is, first, you have a remarkable Savior. And why is He remarkable? Not just because he did something no one else could do, but because he was who no one else could be. You'll notice that in verse 15, it talks about the seed of the woman. Now that's a strange statement, because by God's very design, the seed is provided by the male member of every species. Production carries on through the male and the female. The woman supplies the egg. The man supplies the seed. And here we are told that the woman will produce offspring without the aid of a man. Ladies, you have no seed. But God said the seed of the woman. And this verse gives us the first kernel of a great truth That will be more fully revealed later in Scripture. And this verse is the first prophecy of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand this, Satan did not get it. Adam and Eve did not understand it. But God stated He would send His Son, the Lamb of God, into the world through a woman without the involvement of a man. The Bible talks about it repeatedly. In fact, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Gabriel announced it to Mary in the sixth month. He went into Nazareth, and what did he do? He went to a virgin, verse 27, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Not just a young girl, but the word there is the word parthenos, or parthenos, however you pronounce it, and it means a young woman with no sexual experience, a virgin, a woman who has never been with a man. Gabriel also announced it to Joseph. When Joseph hears Mary is pregnant, he knows he's not the father, and the logical assumption is she's been with another man. I mean, any man would assume that, right? If you have one eye and half sin, you know how it works. But the, ga- the same Gabriel who went to Mary came to Joseph, and the Bible says, but while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, She shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. You know what the name Jesus means, right? Yahweh is salvation. God is saves, if you will. Thou shalt call his name Yahweh is salvation for he shall save his people from their sin. Now why is this important? Why is there such emphasis placed upon the virgin birth of Christ? Why 
do people like me and hopefully you believe that it is essential to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus for salvation? I'll tell you why. It's important because our sin nature is passed down to us not from our mama, but from our daddy. You see, the seed is corrupt. And everyone who is born uh, in the natural way is a sinner. That's why Paul said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It's not just that you sin, it is that you are a sinner. I am a sinner. We're all sinners. And every person who has entered this world through the old-fashioned method of a sexual union between a man and a woman has inherited a sin nature and is a sinner from the moment of conception. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if that doesn't put a fine enough point on it, think about this. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by the faith of Jesus might be given to them that believe. Some people will say, well, I believe everybody's innocent until they mess up. The problem with that is you're not innocent. You've never been innocent. You can't be innocent because you have a sin nature inherited from your father who got it from his, who got it from his all the way back. But Jesus is different because Jesus had no earthly father. He was born without the taint and pollution of sin. He was born pure and he was born sinless. Thus, he is qualified as a man, a sinless man, to die for the sins of the guilty. That is why the Bible can say, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what makes the birth of Jesus so unique is that he was no ordinary baby, but he was and ever will be God in human flesh. So he is a remarkable saint. He comes of the seed of the woman without a human father. But this promised one who is coming into the world, what will he do? I think I just messed up. What will he do? Ladies and gentlemen, he would do battle with the enemy. The Bible says he was coming to bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. That refers to a fatal energy, a fatal injury. If I crush your heel, you'll probably get over it. I'm just saying. It may hurt, but you'll get over it. But if I crush your head... There ain't no coming back from that. It is a fatal injury. He was coming to the world not to teach us a better way to live. He was not coming to enhance our social standing. He wasn't coming to bring us up another rung of the financial ladder. No, he came to defeat evil. That was his mission. And the promised one came to deliver humanity from sin and from, the, and from the power of sin itself. And many people would battle evil over the years. In fact, everybody who knows God battles it to some degree. But this promised one came to defeat sin by delivering it a death blow. Jesus came to kill sin. That is why we can talk about the death of death and the death of Jesus because sin brings death 
And when Jesus died, he killed the thing that brought death. And not only did he kill the thing that brought death, but hallelujah, in his resurrection, he killed death itself. Say glory to his name. He was coming to do what none of us could do for ourselves. He was coming to pay for our sins. We have a remarkable but notice also from that verse, we have a relentless faith. What I mean by that is one who will not give up. Now, the coming king, the coming redeemer, he would be a warrior. God told Adam and Eve there, I will put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The word enmity there means hatred or to be someone's enemy. Now you may think that refers to this natural hatred we have for snakes. And there is something innate in us, I mean even from a little child. When you see a snake, you recoil. That's the way we are by nature. And I think there's something to that here, but this enmity or hatred would be based on something much, much deeper. And it refers to the hatred Satan has for the Lord and all God represents. It refers to the hatred that resides in the heart of the devil and the hatred that caused him to attack Adam and Eve in the garden. It was a hatred that desires nothing less but the overthrow of the Lord and His kingdom. It is a hatred that demands the death of God and the installation of Satan as God. Satan wanted to rule. Adam and Eve didn't know it, but they were caught in the middle of a great cosmic battle, a battle between God and Satan. And it seems to me obvious, it seems obvious to me anyway, why God would attack mankind. Let me show you. Adam, after all, was made in the image of God, right? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the Im image of God created he, him, by the way, male and female, just to put that in there. just so you don't forget. I know it's intolerant. I know it's insensitive. And I know today you can pretend to be something you're not, but it still says male and female. I'm not making it up. I can read. I have at least that much sense to read male and female. And by the way, what you're born as is what you are. Just put that in there. So, as the image of God, leading Adam to sin was a direct attack upon God and upon his purpose to establish a people who would give him worship. But this attack had less to do with mankind, Adam and Eve. It had less to do with them than it, than it did with Satan's desire to wage war on God Almighty. So the one who's coming will be at enmity with the enemy. He will be a warrior. He is coming to engage in battle with a determined foe. He would take up the fight. Adam had lost in the Garden of Eden. He would come to do battle with sin. And spoiler alert, he wins. Huh? Jesus and Jesus, who fulfilled the promises of Genesis 3.15, did just that. Now, from the instant this prophecy was given until Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, Satan did everything in his power to keep the seed of the woman from being born. He worked through Cain to kill Abel, corrupting the bloodline, he thought. He worked in Genesis 6 to corrupt the bloodline through evil marriage. He attempted to have the people of Israel exterminated down in Egypt in Exodus 1 and 2. 
He tried to bring about their destruction, leading them into gross idolatry. Satan even tried to kill Jesus on many occasions. According to Matthew 2, he tried to kill him in Bethlehem when all the children under two were massacred. He tried to lead Jesus into sin so that he could derail the plan of God. He tried in John 6 to get Jesus to claim the cross or the, the, the crown without going to the cross. He even tried to kill Christ, I'm convinced, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Such oppression was upon him that Jesus thought he might die there physically anyway. He believed he had achieved victory when Jesus died on the cross. But what Satan did not realize, that the most remarkable salvo ever fired by heaven was the instant God became sin and died in the sinner's place. And Jesus, the blessed Lamb of God, came into this world as a warrior and He was a relentless Savior who came to this world to win. And He came to bruise the head of the serpent. And He did. Because the word bruise means it's to crush or to strike. Has the idea of grinding something under your foot like you would the dust of the earth. So the serpent might strike the heel of this coming warrior, but the warrior would crush the head of the serpent. Now, was this promise ever fulfilled? Sure it was. It was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. The Lamb of God endured death for God's elect, but death could not hold him. He arose from the grave three days later as a victor, as the victor in the greatest battle ever waged. In his dying and rising again, he inflicted a mortal wound upon the head of the serpent that ultimately will end with him being sentenced to an eternity in the lake of fire. I put this verse in because I want you to read it. I want the devil to read it. And if you're walking with the devil, read it to him for me if he can't read the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Did Jesus win? Yes, he did. Satan is a defeated foe. So what happened is the prince of life entered the arena of death to fight and do battle with the prince of death and the prince of life emerged as the lone victor when the battle ended. Now all of those who know him know his victory and they have and share what he purchased. That is, they have everlasting life. He is the first fruit from the dead. That means he's the first, but he won't be the last. And praise God, I have a new life. I have eternal life today because I am in him. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, He that heareth my word. What are you doing right now? Huh? What are you doing right now? Oh, you're hearing the word, are you? Well, look what it says and believeth on him that hath sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. Jesus said, if you hear the gospel, and you put your faith in the God who sanctioned the gospel, and the God, the Son of God, who died to purchase the gospel, if the Holy Spirit draws you to that conclusion, God said you'll be saved and you'll never come into condemnation. Why is that? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life and we that believe in Him, though we were dead, yet shall we live. And because we live and believe in Him, we shall never die. Pardon my paraphrase, but it's here. Jesus, our relentless Savior, won an eternal victory 
over death, hell, and the grave. And if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Now, what does it mean to be saved? It means to save, to rescue, to preserve, save, and unharmed. You say, well, preacher, I don't know Jesus and I'm okay. Are you really? You okay? Yes, sir, I'm fine. What if I told you you're wrong? What if I told you you have deceived yourself? What if I told you you're lost and separated from God? What if I told you, in fact, that you're dead? That you're already dead? But what if I told you that unless you come to Jesus, you will die in your sins and you will go to hell? But if you will come to Jesus, He will rescue you, He will deliver you from the wrath of God, and He will save you from an eternity in hell. And here's the point. Jesus fought the battle so that you can be saved from the power, penalty, and ultimately the very presence of sin from an eternity in hell, from the wrath of God, from the terror of death, and from the power of Satan. Jesus came to set us free. He fought the battle to deliver you. That's why Paul wrote this, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. That word meet means worthy. Worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us. Same word saved right there. Rescue. Delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us. Same word you think of as a rapture into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness. Jesus did not give up until he had won the victory for all who will believe. So at this point, let me ask you this. Have you trusted Christ? Have you? Now the Bible says there's one coming. And when he comes, you will have a remarkable Savior. You will have a relentless Savior who would not give up until he won your pardon. But in our text down in verse 21, I did say I was going to do one text. I'm going to do two, sorry. You have a redeeming Savior. Look at verse 21. This may be the most important part. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothing. Now, God's already pronounced judgment upon all the guilty parties. Satan is judged. Adam is judged. Eve is judged. Their sentence has been handed, handed down. They are condemned in the eyes of God. They are spiritually dead. They are separated from God because of their sin, which is represented in their nakedness. They are unworthy to be in the presence of the Almighty. They are. But what did God do? God kills an animal of some type and he uses its skin to make garments for Adam and Eve. God takes a life. Now, you and I are accustomed to death, aren't we? Are we not? Everybody's had somebody you love die. I've seen countless people die. Watch them die. Been there. It's a reality to me, and it is to you. But for some people, it's still an abstract, if you know what I mean. They've never seen it. They've never experienced it. Just this week, Charlie, my eight-year-old granddaughter, she told me, she said, Baba, I don't want you to die. Out of the blue. I said, Charlie, I don't want to die either, but one day I will. I hope it's a long time. I hope I get to see you grow up and meet your husband and see your children. I, 
I hope that, but someday I'm going to die. And she said, if you die, I want to die too. And I get that. That's the way I felt about my grandfather. When he died, I wished I were there. But I said, no, you don't. I said, you don't understand death yet. I said, because nobody close to you has died. She's never dealt with it. One day, death will stop being an abstract idea where she has no real comprehension of what it is, and one day it will be a concrete thing. You see, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of that tree in the midst of the garden because the day you eat it, you're going to die. They had no idea what that meant. It was an abstract idea. Nothing had ever died. And then they sinned against God, and as far as they can tell, they're still alive. They recognize there's a problem. They've been judged by God, but hey, man, we're still vertical and ventilating. We're still here, right? God said we would die, so I don't know what it is. And all of a sudden, God comes and takes an animal. An animal that Adam named. An animal that Adam cared for. An animal that was friendly and around Adam and Eve, no doubt, on a daily basis. And God kills the animal while they watch. They see this animal they love. They watch God, no doubt, slit its throat and they watch this blood pour out on the ground. Guess what? Death is no longer an abstract idea. Death has become concrete. Not only do they understand what death is now, but they also know that that animal died because of what they did. The animal had done nothing wrong. It was just doing its thing, grazing or whatever was going on, and God took it up, and God killed it. And God wouldn't do that. Well, the Bible said God did. And in fact, just so you know, that is the pre-incarnate Christ right there. That's Jesus. The one who would die killed the first animal. The very first death in this world, physical death, not spiritual, that had already happened. When Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually. Now they're witnessing physical death, which is the wages of their sin. The innocent took the place of the guilty. And by the way, that's what Jesus did for us. Remember, Jesus was not a sinner. He had no sin. Neither was guile or lying, deceit found in his mouth. He didn't deserve to die. He had no sin to die for. In fact, Jesus, there's a big theological debate about the peccability of Christ. Well, that's a good word, isn't it? Was Christ peccable or impeccable? What does that even mean? Was he posse peccari or non posse peccari? That's Latin for could Jesus sin or could Jesus not sin? Which one was it? Some people say, well, he could have sinned because he was tempted, so he chose not to sin, and that's a good thing. But I would say to you uh, that the ability to sin presupposes a sin nature, and Jesus had no sin nature. It was impossible for him to sin. He could not sin. He could not. I'm in the non posse non picari camp myself. Not possible for Jesus to sin. Period. He had no sin to die for, and yet the wages of sin is death. But look to Calvary and see the Lamb of God nailed to a cross. Watch his tormentors as they spit in his face. Watch them as they put the beard from his cheek. Listen as they mock him, as they taunt him, as they ridicule him and curse him. Watch as the very people he came to save demand for him to be crucified. Can you hear the whip as it slaps against his back time and time again? Can you feel the agony as he is nailed to the cross through his, through his wrists and feet and he's lifted up from, from earth to heaven to die? Can you, can you watch as the blood pours from the, the wounds in his head, his hands, and his feet? Can you see it as it runs down the cross and pools on the ground? Understand that everything he suffered, every stripe on his back, Every agony 
Jesus experienced, every disgrace He endured, everything He endured in His life, His trial and His death was because of you. You. You get that? Remember the first man? He stood before God naked. What happened? He was judged by God. Right? That's the first Adam. Stood before God naked. He was judged. Jesus, the last Adam, hung on a cross before God naked. And he was judged in the place of the sinner. And he bore our judgment. He endured our hell. His visage was more marred than any man. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We saw him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes that is in his death, we are here. Why? Because all we like to have gone astray. We've turned every one to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Later on in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You get that? You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he crushed the head of Satan. He killed him. He's still alive, you know that. But he's already been judged. And his sentence has been read. He's going to hell. When Jesus died, he killed sin. When he died, he killed death. When he died, he killed every enemy we have. And Satan could only bruise his heel. But God the Father crushed him. God poured out his wrath in the body of his darling son that you and I might be saved. You say, preacher, I don't like that kind of religion. I know, I get it. It's all bloody and gory and gooey and it's just yucky. It think about guys on crosses and blood dripping down and flesh ripped open and backs turned to hamburger and thorns in somebody's head and oh it's just gross yeah and that's why the liberals are going to hell that's the gospel and the bible says that without the shedding of blood there is no remission for my sin someone had to die for my sin someone did die for my sin someone was judged in my place. Why? Because the best I can do is filthy rags in the eyes of God. But my very best, I'm a sinner. You get it? Right now, when I'm preaching, and I'm doing my best to preach, and I'm doing my best to declare the Word of God and trying to show you what Christ did for us a sinner, a sinner is doing this. A sinner prepared this. And a sinner will face God with this. Because my best is filthy in the eyes of God. But we try to craft those garments, don't we? We're like Adam and Eve, man. We try to make those fig leaves and put on us. I look pretty good, don't I know? like a sinner that's what you look like every one of you no offense but you're all wicked and so am I but that's why God sent a redeemer who would die on the cross take our sins upon him that we might be made the righteousness of God in him the whole point of this is, is coming up right here Ladies and gentlemen, you can try anything you want, you want to. You can try religion. 
You can try good works. You can try clean living. Anything you want to try to please God. But you'll need a whole lot more to deal with your sin than that. <laughs> you see, you can clean up the outside. But it's not the outside that's the problem. It's the inside. Because what you do on the outside is a reflection of who you are on the inside. And when you meet Jesus, he changes the inside, and that can make the outside pleasing to God. But until the inside is fixed, the outside is always going to be corrupt. And no matter how much lipstick you put on a pig, it's still a pig. There you go. I gave my dog a bath yesterday. Why? Because she gets dirty. She's a dog. She chases things. She hates squirrels. And she tries to treat every squirrel. The other night, she treated a coo. She runs the deer out of the yard. Yes, we live in town. Yes, we have deer everywhere. She hates them all. But she doesn't hate rabbits. Isn't that weird? She's around rabbits all the time. She don't pay any attention. But she goes outside and she runs through the weeds and she digs in the dirt and she rolls around because she's a dog. I got her in yesterday, put her up the seat, washed her down, cleaned her up real good, dried her off, put her collar back on, turned her loose, and after a while it came time to take her out. Guess what she did? Dog stuff. You know why? She's a dog. Just because she smelled better didn't mean she was better. Giving her a bath didn't fix her. But I'll tell you what the blood of Jesus does. It makes us accepted in the beloved. Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know, I wish, I hate to use that word because it's, hints of magic, but I can't think of a better one right now. <laughs> I wish Adam and Eve had never sinned in the Garden of Eden. Imagine what the world would be like today if they hadn't. Imagine what it would be like to live in a perfect world. Well, i tell you what we wouldn't be doing. We wouldn't be here today. There would be a need for it. We'd just be worshiping God 24-7. I mean, you know, but they did. They did sin. A and because they did, you and I were born into a world with a desperate sin problem. And I thank God that he saw our need before the problem ever existed. And it was already foreordained of God that he would come and die on the cross as a perfect sacrifice. So the reason I preach this today is to remind you this is the message of Christmas. This is it. It's the fact that God sent his son to die for sinners on the cross. And that's the real reason for Christmas. So I would ask you, do you know that Jesus is more than a baby? Do you realize he can be your Savior? Or is Jesus to you just a story in a book, a sweet thought, and nothing more? You know what happened to Adam and Eve? they eventually came to the end of their life. And guess what they did? They died. Adam was 930 years old when he died. I don't know how old Eve was. But they died. And they went out into eternity. And guess what? It's coming to you, and it's coming to me. Charlie said she didn't want me to die. But I will. No matter what she wants. It doesn't matter. I don't want you to die. I don't want my family to die. But we all will. But what matters is what happens to us after we die. And what happens to us after we die is determined by what we do with Jesus while we live. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God 
hath not wrought. So what does the birth of Jesus mean for you? It means that God sent His Son to die for your sins on the cross, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, and if you would come to Him by faith, He will save you. Are you saved? If you are, rejoice, my friend. If you're not, come to Christ. Don't wait. Don't let anything hold you back. Don't let anyone stand in your way. Get to Jesus while you can. Because one day soon, you're going to die. Isn't that good news on Christmas? You're going to die. Merry Christmas. What a sense of irony. But how true it is. I'm dying right now even as I speak to you. Trying to hold on to life. Took a handful of pills this morning. Doctor said, they'll make you better. I think he's lying to me. I think he does it, so I got to keep coming in every three months. Get new prescriptions. He can make some money off of them. That's what I told him one day. He disagreed. He lives in a better home and nicer car than I've got, and I think that's what it's about. The point being, I'm taking every step I can to live longer, or at least live a quality life while I'm here. How about you? Do you know you're dying? Do you know what will happen to you when you do? That's the main thing. Don't make some preacher have to get up and lie about you and say good things about you when you're gone. Be sure they can tell the truth. And I will, I will, by the way. I won't lie about you. I promise you that. I promise you that. I will not lie about you. I'll find something good to say. If you don't know Christ, and I know you don't know Christ, I'm not going to preach you into heaven. You might as well go ahead and line up with somebody else to do your funeral if that's what you're looking for. Because I will not lie to you or anybody. I won't do it. Do you know that you know that you know? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for fulfilling the wonderful promise in Genesis 3.15. Thank you for sending your Son to die for our sins on the cross that we might have everlasting life. Thank you for the good grace of God. Now, Father, I pray for these folks that you bless them, give them a great Christmas. I pray that your hand rests upon them, you bless them and their families, and I pray, God, you minister to the needs they have, use them for your glory, bless them in great ways, and I pray for those in the church right now who are lost, that you'll touch them and save them, and I pray for those who are out of your will, you draw them home. Father, thank you. As we sing right now about your amazing grace, I pray that you'll get glory unto yourself. We ask it in your name for your sake. Amen. All right, Brother CJ, come on. And you know, um, he said we have a remarkable, relentless, redeeming Savior, but we also have a returning Savior. That's right. And because of, because of him, because of his amazing grace, we have life as we stand. Page 163. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You can do better than that. Come on, man. Suck in that wind down to the diaphragm and let it go. <coughs> do that. <coughs> Let's hear it. Come on. Start over. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> 
from the top. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Proud of you. Appreciate you. Don't you look good? Huh? Boo. There we go. That's better. All right, a couple quick things. Now, uh, pray for Jim Robbins. He's still in the hospital. I talked to him last night. He sounded pretty good. But pray for him. He's going back to share maybe Tuesday. Going back to share Tuesday. So keep praying for Brother Jim. Keep praying for Sister Linda Money. Have a lot of sickness right now. Kevin Phillips contacted me last night. His whole family's sick. Uh, Karen Nelson's sick. Jimmy's here. He's not. He's still sick too, but he's here. Ricky Borders is sick. There's a bunch of sickness right now. So keep that in mind and pray for one another. It's Christmas season. Remember all of our shut-ins and all these on our prayer list. And uh, this coming week, there will be no service Wednesday night, okay? Recover from Christmas and be back next Sunday ready to go. All right? Got it? All right. May the Lord bless you. Shake hands with somebody. Give them a $100 bill. Wish them Merry Christmas. All right, you're at liberty.